Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We really have a special treat today because we're speaking with our own Indiana Center for Middle East Peace board member and friend, Dr. Ahmed Abdelmajid, who identifies himself on his blog, among other things, among other things. I, I'm not going to list them all, Ahmed, but Palestinian, Muslim, American, coffee addict, Nutella fiend, pseudo writer, interfaith ninja, intellectual vigilante, and undisputed king of snark. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I mean, we, we may get to one or more of those, but uh, I do have that out in public. So. <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm not sharing anything you haven't already shared publicly. And okay. I'd, al I'd also add, of course, the host of the well-received, very important, I would say, podcast based on his very popular TED Talk, The Eye in Immigrant. So Ahmed, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, uh, you see a number of your friends on the screen, and I know some of your friends will be watching this because they're at work this afternoon. They'll be watching it later. Um, on a personal level, uh, how are you and Heather and the kids faring during these COVID times? We're doing well. Uh, thank you for asking. Well, uh, first, I'll start by saying thank you for, for having me, and it's good to see a lot of um, good friends that I haven't seen in person in a while, and uh, welcome everyone to, to the talk. Um, Heather and the kids are doing well. We've, uh, we've fared better, I think, because of our neighbors who have kids similar to our kids' age. So our kids didn't really miss out a lot on the social interaction part. They're out in the backyard playing with the neighbor's kids most of the days and uh, enjoying the outdoors. We, we stopped the going inside the house part. But, um, uh, you know, still feeling the... Uh, bit of loneliness and pressure of being isolated from everyone else, but uh, thankful and, and blessed in many different ways. Good. Let's, let's, get, let's get to it. Uh, your wife, Heather, is a registered nurse and you're a pharmacist. Um, and Ahmed, one of the things you're known for uh, in our community is your lecture to university healthcare and community groups on healthcare for the Muslim patient. Um, it seems like every other day there's an article in the paper about one of the hospitals, about the changing face of healthcare, and more. T talk to us about the COVID response in our state and in Northeast Indiana, and if you'd like more generally about the state of healthcare in our community. Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, and, I, and I don't know if I'm uh, equipped enough to answer it in, um, in detail or in, in, in more than what you know, a lot of people know. The, 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 my job since shifting out of academia back to now floating with CVS um, have been impacted in the way that we approach the business, but obviously an essential business uh, and have to, uh, to be there for the community. Uh, I think overall there's um, room for improvement. Um, in general, what I see, and I don't think that that's specific to our area, but I, I feel that uh, we've politicized science and um, we've added science to everything else that we seem to have strong, staunch, differing opinions on. And unfortunately, that's trickling down to choices that, you know, on the, on the, um, surface may seem as a personal choice, but they have impact on everybody around you. So, uh, you know, not everybody's wearing a face mask when they come to the pharmacy, um, you know, better than I expected, but still, you know, we're not, we're not taking the simple steps to help uh, stop the spread as we've been instructed or as, as science tells us that that could possibly be the better way to do it. Um, so in general, I, I, I think there's still room for improvement and there are still better choices that we can, uh, we can all make. Um, 
but we've fared better than other communities as well. So I think we're doing a, a, an okay job. But again, I don't have the technical details and know how to really assess that. I've spent some time on your uh, blog, uh, as the introduction showed. Uh, in fact, I spent quite a bit of time there. Uh, and I'll just plug it for you. If you want to plug it later, that's fine. It's nomad78 dot weebly w e e b l y dot com nomad seventy eight dot weebly dot com. Here's an excerpt from one of your poems from two thousand sixteen. Sixty eight years ago, my home was no longer free. I became a refugee. Sixty eight years ago, I was forced to live in three foreign lands away from my grandfather's love and my grandmother's caring hands. I couldn't bury them nor in their funerals stand. 68 years ago, I became a victim of colonization. I was hit with a somber realization that although I'm the victim here, here I need to live in fear. 68 years ago, I became a refugee 68 years ago, I became me. Talk to us a little bit about that poem and what it meant to you and what it still means. Well, that, um, that was written on the 68th anniversary of the occupation of my homeland of Palestine. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's just a reflection uh, that I, believe a lot of Palestinians do share, which is the fact that um, our home uh, was taken away from us by an invading um, occupying that continues to occupy and continues to expand uh, government. It was the Zionist forces that uh, established the state of Israel. Um, and I, I think in, in, in that moment, I just wanted to bring to uh, whoever reads it, uh, bring to their attention the humanity behind the label. And, and that's really humanizing the label has been kind of my um, personal mission over the past few years. I, once it crystallized in my mind that what we do is a lot of times associate uh, quick shorthands to a label that define the person who carries it, uh, my intent from that and all other work has been to give a voice, give a face, give emotions to to that um, to that label. And so the label in that particular poem is Palestinian uh, that carries different meanings. When I grew up in the Arab world, its understanding uh, of the word Palestinian to coming to Canada and then the U.S. and the understanding of the word Palestinian or what it carries or the, um, you know, the complexity uh, behind it or just the, the emotion that uh, I get when people say, well, it's complicated and I can't really comment or I can't really understand yeah. this. So, so it's, it's a way to give life to uh, a label that not a lot of people uh, delve deeper or go beyond. I want you to expand upon that, but in this context, virtually every time you're interviewed, you, uh, you're you asked to share your story, you know, your family story from Palestine to Qatar to, uh, uh, well, Palestine, Yuvna, and then Rafa, then uh, to Qatar, then Canada, and then to uh, the U.S. But you now just mentioned something that really intrigues me, and you talked about your personal mission. So t tell us your family story and your personal story, but then also this, this growing sense in you as you, you know, as you matured, as you moved, this growing sense of this personal mission mm -hmm. and how each place kind of helped to form and shape you in this personal mission of yours. Yeah, so, so in... Uh, um rather quickly the the story is my my father was about eight my mother was about five when their hometown of Yibna, palestine was occupied by by uh the israeli forces uh and they their hometown was uh, basically ethnically cleansed so they all had to leave and they left 
living in Gaza for a short period and then settling in Rafah on the border with Egypt um, and getting a refugee travel document issued by the government of Egypt. That's how my father uh, eventually traveled out. I think he might have been 19 or 20, I don't remember. Traveled out of Rafah, uh, went to Qatar in, in the Arabian Gulf, uh, got a job and then went back, married my mom, and they started their family. So all my siblings and I, and I'm, I'm the youngest of five, were all born and raised in Qatar. Um, but in Qatar, you're born, you, you, you live there as a resident of the country. Um, you, you never become a citizen, uh, except in certain circumstances, or we have a higher up who's interested in the work that you do, or have connections within one of the major sheikhs in the area. So we lived as um, uh, residents dependent on my dad's employment. Uh, basically, if he loses employment, then we have to f he has to find another job within a certain period of time. Otherwise, we had to leave the country. So he always lived with that sense of the place where you were born and raised is not home. Um, and don't get me wrong, they were generous uh, growing up, free public education, free public health and all of that. But again, that sense of this place, I can't call this place home. Um, and then, so for my parents, the, the understanding of higher education is our ticket to, to freedom, our ticket to um, getting established somewhere. And so all of us have um, uh, uh, post-secondary education, at university and college degrees. And that's how I found myself in, you know, Canada and the United States, and and getting my my uh, my degrees and living here. But how there was you, how old were you when you came to Canada? Uh, eighteen, actually, after high school. I started off actually in, in Cleveland for about a few months, and then we got the landed immigrant status in Canada, and because uh, my father was was trying to get us to move to to get us um, papers in Canada, and we got it, and I moved to Canada for about a few years, and then moved to the U.S. in two thousand. Um, so I always had a sense of, or, or a, a question of who am I, uh, you know, growing up in a place where, again, uh, this is home, but it's not home, uh, and coming again to the U.S. and, and um, uh, wrestling with my identity, you know, going through the culture shock, going through college, education, being exposed to a lot more uh, than uh, what I was exposed to growing up. Uh, I found that I needed to center myself in identifying or understanding who I am. And then the growth that you, you alluded to happened over the years and over uh, engaging and interacting with other people, realizing that who I am is not just one thing. And there are multiple layers to my identity and intersectionalities of my identity uh, or my identities. Um, and I'm, I'm I think I'm, I'm blessed in the sense that I'm in tune with that and understand that and uh, took advantage of my ability to to speak about it with, with comfort, not feel embarrassed or, or um, annoyed by the question or anything like that, to try and relate that to others who uh, may not have similar experiences or, again, may just say, oh, he's an immigrant and, and that's it. It gives them one particular image in their head to talk about the intersectionalities. And that intersectionality touches upon many different people from many different backgrounds and walks of life, but there's a very uh, shared commonality in whether it's the struggle or the success or the experience uh, that, uh, you know, um, again, expanded my uh, ability to see beyond just me as a Palestinian or me as a Muslim. You know, you mentioned this. I wanted to ask you about that. You've been interviewing immigrants now in Northeast Indiana. Uh, I mean, you, you're part of the, a community, uh, not only Muslim immigrants, but others. And now you've taken this to the next level and you've begun this podcast, The I and Immigrant. And as you pointed out, although each story is unique, say a little bit more about the commonalities and the immigrant experience in our community. What, what have you learned from these podcasts about the unique, you know, uniqueness, but also the commonalities? Well, I mean, the, the uniqueness, I think, is, uh, is in, in each person's story and their expectations of what living here would be. 
uh, or how it would turn out or, um, you know, the, their, their idea of America. Uh, and I think the commonality is in uh, the experience. And, and it's not to say that the experience is negative or extremely positive or this, that, or the other, but ju just the fact that uh, we all struggle with homesickness. We all, uh, you know, to various degrees, but it's, it's present in a lot of people. And I think in, in um, the recap episode where Katie Anderson and I talk about the interviewees, I shared that uh, one of the, the, not the, the shockers to me, but one of the ones that I'm like, ah, I, I caught myself not realizing that I would react that way was to um, Irene, who's Italian. Yeah. Um, you know, Italian, uh, Christian, white. Um, and, you know, we all, it, nowadays we speak highly of the Italian accent and the Italian culture and all of that. So I thought that she would have a much easier transition um, and an easier way to, to just, you know, assimilate and everything than I would. Uh, and I found that it was very similar to a lot of the experiences that, I, that, that I've had and others have shared with me. You're talking about Irene uh, Poxia from Amani Health, uh, uh, Amani Family Services. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, again, I've learned <laughs> the, the, uh, the, 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 I think deep down the emotional um, uh, aspect of the immigrant experience is very much shared um, the same way, maybe at different levels of intensity, but it's, it's shared uh, across the board, regardless of where you come from. What, what have you learned about your, your um, Muslim brothers and sisters at the UEF and in other mosques? I mean, I know you're close with the folks at the Burmese mosque, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well. Um, some of them are professional uh, people with professional uh, uh, careers, positions, jobs. Others are not. And uh, um, what, what are you learning from them as well about their experience? I mean, I'm sure that uh, um, they, they uh, are different in some ways too. And they are. And, you know, actually... I mean, you... language, for example, for you is not a problem. Irene, uh, maybe not. Uh, language was not a problem. But, but for others, language may be the first obstacle to, that, that uh, they're facing, you know? And, and it is. And especially, you know, if you've come here um, as a refugee or seeking an asylum and it wasn't something that you prepped for beforehand, you know, learning the language to come in and, and go to school or something like that. And, and that's an obstacle, but that's an obstacle that in a way easier to overcome. You know, you learn, uh, uh, even if you learn enough just to get by and to get through your, your day to day. Uh, what I'm learning is, uh, you know, all the, uh, so for example, when, when I spoke with Abdel, uh, who's from Chad, uh, Muslim young man from Chad. Uh, there are the immigrant issues and concerns and questions and whatever, but on top of it, he's also a black young man living in the United States. So that's yeah. an added layer to complexity for him. Uh, or Hamza from Yemen, or, you know, others that you talk to from Pakistan or Afghanistan, you know, haven't uh, had them on the podcast yet, but will in future seasons. And so the, the, um, the issue I think that's common across the board from all who I talk to is how do I handle the pressure of getting acculturated or assimilated or, or knowing my way around this new uh, life, but on top of it, all the negativity that I'm facing and especially over the past few years. Um, so the sense of intrigue of, oh, where you're from, is now a sense of where you're from that you know I want to value you based on the place in which you came from and that adds a whole lot of pressure and you're talking uh, you know as a Muslim and the negativity surrounding Muslims ever since September 11 and the heightened negativity I would say uh, that adds a, a layer of pressure to me it's something that I've you know I've been here for about 24 years I've dealt with it, I can navigate it, I can talk about it, uh, but to someone who's newer to the country or someone who's not um, 
uh, doesn't have a, a good a handle on the English language and is unable to express him or herself, that causes other uh, added layers of, of complexity to their experience here. I, I want to pr pursue this line just a little further, if you don't mind. Uh, um, obviously, you know, for those of us who were born and raised here, oftentimes it's easy to think about refugees or immigrants as a basically just changing of geography, but you're reminding us that <clears throat> you're not just crossing national borders, but there's psychological and emotional and political, racial uh, borders that immigrants and refugees are, are facing too. So I, say a little bit, say a little bit more about maybe the, the, the political boundaries that you have to cross and if you want to, if you want to say more about the emotional boundaries, that's great. But mm -hmm. political and social boundaries, and and maybe something about maybe the resources that are available in town, uh, uh, maybe organizationally, but also maybe smaller, uh, more personal resources for immigrants and refugees in our community. So those are about four questions in one, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try and, and remember to answer them all. So uh, I think from, from the emotional standpoint, there's always, uh, and I know I'm, I'm using absolute terms, but you know, take it with a grain of salt, but there's always that sense of an emotional response or reaction. I mean, one of the things that I've, that I've talked about and talked about with others is that Every single day, there is that thought in my head of I'm just going to pack up and go. Um, and, and even with someone, you know, I, Qatar is the place I was born and raised and I understand fully and logically that it's not my home because I was, you know, told always that it's not my home. But I always have that sense of, uh, you know, I'm just so burnt out. I'm so tired uh, that I just want to go back. And in my head, it's going back to my high school days with my high school friends and how simpler life was. So it's, it's tainted in that sense, but there's always that sense of, I just want to go back. Um, and it, it varies in intensity based on what's going on uh, uh, during the day or the month or the political arena or the religious arena or whatever. So that uh, on the emotional, you never really leave that baggage uh, behind. There's always that sense of nostalgia, that sense of, uh, homesickness, uh, I, I, again. Um, but, you know, you, it's an emotion just like all other emotions that you have that you, you learn to, to live with and understand and deal with uh, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, as far as uh, uh, the um, political, I think you mentioned, uh, again, there is, one of the things that, that I think is a big issue for us in, in the United States and a big issue for us as a society that we need to overcome is simplifying complex issues to uh, one or the other, black or white, this or that, us or them. Um, there is so much gradient in between option A and option B. There are so many th layers to it that we don't, um, uh, that if we don't spend the time and energy to understand, uh, we create a m much more divided community. And that division that we've, again, has been heightened over the past few years, uh, takes its toll on, again, the camp in which you fall. Uh, so if you fall in the camp of, uh, uh, of Afghanistan Muslim, you're carrying the brunt or you're dealing with the brunt of the political uh, discussion. And, you know, others understanding of the dynamics there and they don't see you as a human being, you know, you know, that's what, I'm, what I talk about is that I have worries and concerns about my kid's future, about our health, about home, about money, about taxes, about this and that and the other. But on top of it, I have to worry about people back home that we you know, our governments think about starting a war with, or people back home that our government support the government that's invaded it, you know, in the particular case of Palestine, or also worry about the response of people that I talk to who 
are fed one or the other, you know, uh, as far as how to view me as a Palestinian Muslim or an Afghanistani Muslim or Iraqi Muslim or Iraqi Christian or this, that or the other. So there's always that added layer uh, in, in, in the, uh, to, the, to the person who was not born and raised here, uh, if that makes sense, when we talk about the emotional and the political. And so the political uh, um, consequences or ramifications are beyond impacting me as a, a, an American living in the United States because I have family in Palestine. I have family in Qatar. I have family in other places. So there's a lot more, um, uh, I, I think, or I'd say a lot are more attuned to our international politics as well uh, beyond just the national uh, rhetoric. So I think that's two of the four questions that you asked me. Yeah. That well, let, let me follow up then, man. Um... You've been here, you said a number of years. Um, are there particular organizations that you point um, uh, friends of yours who are immigrants, refugees, I know Catholic Catholic, uh, Catholic charities, uh, Amani Family Services. I, I really am so impressed with Amani Family Services and the work that Irene Poxy is doing there and her whole paid staff and volunteer staff. Are, are, are there others? Uh, and are, are you a resource? Uh, do you find resources in the mosque? Uh, what other personal resources might there be for someone? I think for a lot of people, they, they try and find um, their own kind to begin with. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to put it in such terms, but you know, they, they'll find a community that's very similar to the community in which they came from. So a lot of times, and, and even still 24 years uh, of me living here, if I'm moving to a new place, I always look at the uh, Muslim landscape, the Muslim demographics. Do they have a mosque? Do they have, uh, you know, a Muslim community of sorts that's for for me and for my family to uh, uh, to grow up in? So that's always almost the uh, the immediate thing that people would look for. Um, so in my case, mosques. Uh, in uh, the case of the Burmese, there's the mosque, but there's also a temple and there's a church that's also Burmese run. So I think the, the religious aspect, uh, if, you know, if they're religious, that's what they, what they seek uh, first. Uh, but then you've mentioned a couple of great organizations, Amani and Catholic Charities that have resources beyond the, uh, the uh, I'd say the emotional and cultural sustenance that you would need from uh, people from your community, and that's more on how to, uh, you know, find work, how to deal with issues uh, at home that might come up. Uh, I think these these places are great. I would uh, give a shout out to um, Welcoming Fort Wayne uh, and the website that Melissa Reinhardt has put together. Uh, it has a lot of great resources for a lot of folks, whether immigrants or not, uh, and in particular about our um, uh, immigrant communities in, in Fort Wayne. Uh, I would say that that would be one of the top resources that I would go to. I know a little bit about Southside High School. Uh, my kids went there um, and over 70 something languages and dialects are spoken there. I found that um, Fort Wayne has been a welcoming community to people of different ethnicities, colors, religious traditions, and cultures. Uh, but of course, um, you know, I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, has that been your experience too? I mean, f and I know that you've worked with Mayor Henry and people from his staff on various initiatives. Uh, what's your take on Fort Wayne as a welcoming community? Uh, I think the the biggest personal testament to Fort Wayne for me is uh, once my uh, position with uh, Manchester was eliminated uh, and I knew that uh, I didn't have um, uh, my, my career in academia is would require me to leave Fort Wayne to go to another institution. Uh, I think the biggest testament is that we said, uh, no, we're going to stay in Fort Wayne. Uh, it's been a wonderful city. We've lived here for nine years. Uh, made a lot of um, good connections, good friends. Uh, it's beautiful. It's growing. It's a good place for uh, the kids. It's safe, good public schools, and has been uh, a lot uh, more welcoming than other places that I that I have lived in uh, as well. And 
finding that or, or risking losing this to go somewhere else just for um, a, a career in academia or to continue my, my work in academia was not worth it. Um, so Fort Wayne has been uh, open in the sense of I've spoken in many different places, uh, places of worship, uh, organizations and things like that about these issues. So there is a, a thirst in here for learning more about diversity, inclusion, about immigrants, about Islam, about this that I've uh, experienced in other places. And that speaks to the um, curiosity of the people. The questions are more in the sense of, you know, I don't understand it, help me understand, rather than uh, defend your position on this, or why do you people think this way or do that or, or what have you. So, so again, I'd say the biggest personal testament uh, for me is that we chose to stay in Fort Wayne and make it work rather than, you know, uh, pick up and leave and go somewhere else. I want to ask you um, um, about. Uh, I want to press you a little bit more about this the the, the immigrant status in uh, in in the U.S. Over the years, I, I've taught classes in world religions, maybe thirty or forty different classes, and always I include a unit on a particular religious tradition in the U.S. And this has been my contention that. Immigrants to America, there are two streams. Both are true. One, you mentioned immigrants and their idea of America and why they come. Uh, the two streams are these. On the one hand, uh, as they acculturate themselves to American cultural uh, uh, practices, norms, traditions, and mores, they want to become part of the, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so America imprints itself, American values, mores, it imprints itself on the immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, by their very presence here, our immigrant communities with their various cultures and languages and ethnicities and religions, they help to shape the future of the American experiment. In other words, they imprint American culture with now a, a new, a more expansive view of what America might be, what mm -hmm. it could be. So America imprints itself on the immigrant community and new immigrant communities imprints itself and changes the face of what America can become. Uh, is that your, talk to us a little bit about those two streams. So, so when I moved here uh, again in 96, the term that was, was peddled is that uh, the melting pot, that America is the melting pot, uh, that you come in and you become American. Um, I never understood what American is, <laughs> you know, because so the term that I, that I like more and I think is more uh, or closer to reality is a mosaic. Uh, we have um, each piece on its own is beautiful, but when you put that piece in the bigger picture, the bigger picture is a lot more beautiful. So I don't lose myself as an Arab American Muslim immigrant uh, living in the United States and becoming an American. I don't lose my identity or who I came from, but I'm changed. My thought process about certain things have changed. Certain elements and, and views of life have changed because of being able to live in the United States. So I'm beautiful on my own, but when you put me in that mosaic, that bigger picture as one piece within that America, uh, the picture is a lot more beautiful. It's a lot bigger. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's it's almost you know and, and as a piece I'm not an island on myself I'm interacting with others and I'm and I'm part of the whole so to me it's I I, I influence and I'm influenced um, I think there are opportunities here that in the United States and everybody thinks of opportunities in economic senses sense but opportunities in uh, ability to express ability to to convince ability to reach other people that are not available in different uh, 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 countries or, or, or uh, uh, 
uh, other places that having this ability here is how I influence and I'm influenced. So it's, it's dynamic. It's always definitely a, uh, an interactive piece. It's never the melting pot. I mean, I think early on, we tried to make it into a melting pot, come here and th these are the ideals that we, we value. And, uh, but that's just not sustainable. And I think the fact that we have that flexibility here uh, to be an interactive piece is what makes us unique uh, as an experiment as you refer to it. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, uh, our friend Victoria Gibson. Uh, it, she, I'm going to just read what she wrote here in the question and you can uh, respond. In the early 80s, 10 years after the fall of Saigon, Fort Wayne had a sizable Vietnamese refugee population. They're now in their second and third generations in our community. Have you had the opportunity to speak with immigrant families who have later generations here and how they're faring, I mean, I'm assuming she's asking not just for the Vietnamese, but for any of them, mm -hmm. how they're faring in their second and third generations. Stay tuned for season two and three. <laughs> <laughs> so season one, uh, I'm an immigrant and I'm hoping, you know, I, I just talked with, uh, with Katie Anderson and, and WBOI is still very interested in continuing the work. Uh, the first season was talking with the immigrants direct, directly, and, and obviously there are a lot more that I haven't interviewed yet. Season two um, is shifting into still conversations with other immigrants and maybe outside of just Northeast Indiana or Indiana, but also shifting to the family and family dynamics. So the spouse of an immigrant, the child of an immigrant, um, you know, my wife, her dad is Dutch, came to the U.S. when he was 24, and then she's married to me. So she's the child of an immigrant and the spouse of an immigrant. So her dynamics and her family idea or ideals are, are different, you know. So I want to interview these folks as well, but also moving uh, further down the interviews, ideas, and lists is to talk to uh, someone who's a third generation, fourth generation what of the original culture do they hold on to and what values do they keep and, and so on and so forth. So yes, great question. And, uh, and yes, I hope to get to that. Um, if you're asking from the podcast perspective, from personal interviews and or personal discussions and conversations. Um, yes, but maybe more of the second generation haven't gotten to third and fourth uh, to talk more about, you know, how, how far uh, removed or close they are to, uh, to the origin from where they came from. Um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your, uh, uh, your faith, uh, but from this perspective, uh, as you know, because you're on our board, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is uh, at our gala uh, next month is presenting our Community Bridge Builder Award to the Muslim Alliance of Indiana based in Indianapolis. It's an organization that you know real well. And we as an organization were presented with their uh, Interfaith Excellence Award in 2015. Yeah. Uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about what it's like being a Muslim in America, in Indiana, in Fort Wayne, but also about maybe how you see Muslim values aligning with uh, American values of diversity and equality and freedom and, and how, how you see them in alignment, not in conflict. Yeah, I, I see a lot more alignment than conflict in, in a lot of ways. Um, on, on the personal level, uh, you know, faith is challenging, I think, regardless of what faith you're in nowadays. Uh, a lot of people are moving away from organized religion or structured religion. So there's that overall uh, pressure, if you will. Um, so being faithful is one thing. Being uh, faithful within the Muslim faith is, an, is again, an added layer. So um, it's challenging in the sense of, you know, I grew up with one particular understanding of the religion, uh, while there's a lot of diversity within the thought. I mean, the foundations of the faith are the same. The, you know, Muslim prays the same way across the board, wherever you are, you know, these things, but there are gradations in the gray matter uh, issues and questions and, and learning that there are more 
answers to one question than one answer was something new to me that I experienced moving to uh, the United States and, and seeing Muslims from various walks of life. Uh, so to me, it's a constant growth um, uh, approach to, to my faith that I'm, that I'm thankful for. Uh, while I've seen it with others where they completely um, freaked out by it and the instability of it and just said, I don't want anything to do with it and, and just completely um, gave up on, on the, the, the practice of the religion or the religion itself. As far as alignment of, of values, uh, you know, the values of, of, um, of uh, uh, freedom, the values of sanctity of life, uh, the values of, uh, of uh, family unit, um, uh, these issues, uh, you know, I'm, I can do that here and prosper with it. And, you know, it's uh, in alignment, at least with my understanding of, of American uh, values. Um, and I think there was a second part to your question that I am trying to remember. Sorry, Michael, could you remind me of what you asked? The second? You don't have to remind me, actually. <laughs> uh, I think you were asking about... Uh, oh, oh, yeah, are, are you finding it to be amenable to, I mean, uh, America has yeah. been welcoming, Indiana. Uh, yeah. I mean, you kind of thrived. That you've, you've been a, a board member of Muslim Alliance of Indiana in the past and other other Muslim organizations, not just here in Fort Wayne, but statewide, right? I mean, uh, uh, so it's, it's been a welcoming place for you. It, it definitely has been. It's, it's been a welcoming place. Uh, I have not had any issues uh, or obstructions at the mosque or even uh, reading the Quran at the governor's iftar in the state house in Indianapolis. Uh, not, I mean, not to say that it's all rosy and, and there are no uh, uh, challenges, there definitely is, but uh, not in the same sense of flagrant uh, discrimination uh, or flagrant, uh, you can't do this here. Uh, that I have not experienced, or if I have there, I, I can count them on my fingers over the past 24 years. But I think you were asking about alignment of Islamic values with values of, of equality, of equity, of, uh, 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 appreciation of the worth of the individual and all of that. Uh, and yes, uh, I find a lot of alignment in that. I draw a lot of inspiration uh, in the work that I do from uh, my faith. So, you know, uh, my, my work in diversity and inclusion and talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, experiences of people other than, than me. So if we talk about, you know, experiences of a uh, uh, black person in America, I can, I can relate, I will never understand it because I'm not a black man living in the United States, but I can understand it and surely understand the, uh, the basic requirement of, to, of being treated equally. Uh, Prophet Muhammad in his, in his um, final sermon, uh, he said that, you know, explicitly that there is no difference between a black or a white or, you know, a, a, an Arab and a non-Arab. You know, the only difference is piety and piety is a matter of the heart and that's in, in, in the hands of God or, or God's evaluation of one's piety. So the treatment of one to the other is uh, on the, not based on skin color, not based on origin, uh, but rather on uh, respect, mutual respect and, uh, uh, and you know, uh, valuing of the other's hum humanity. I, uh, well, amen to that. Um, I, re I read a poem from your blog earlier, but I want to, I want to return to, uh, Palestine for just a second. Uh, you and I have talked before about traveling, traveling with me to Palestine or, you know, traveling together to Palestine. And, and you've said that you've had reservations, uh, how you, you long to, to return to Palestine and you're, I'm not sure you use the word afraid, but you're, you're, you're afraid, not in, in, in terms of being in danger, but mm -hmm. you're afraid that you'd want to stay back in Palestine once you got there. Talk a little bit about the, the, the tug, the tug of war in your heart about heading home to Palestine. And, and I've had that conversation with you and with others and my nephew in particular, who likes to go every couple of years. Um, I think 
that what I'm afraid of is um, having the whole situation materialized to me personally. Because you've not been, I, I should tell everybody here, you've not been to Palestine. I think I was two years old when, you know, my parents took me there, but no, I, I have no uh, uh, experience as, you know, cognizant experience of being in Palestine. Again, I think I was two years old. And so I know how emotionally attached I am and how I react emotionally to the situation. Uh, that what I fear is that if I see it in my own eyes, I wouldn't be able to um, walk away or turn around from it. One of, one of the things um, when we talk about uh, some of the other things that I, that I talk about, vulnerable and underserved patient populations and people in poverty and healthcare and issues like that. And one of the things that uh, students that travel to um, countries that you know, are way worse off than the most impoverished person in the United States. Uh, and what I've learned from, from working with them and talking to them is that they need debriefing before and debriefing after. Because the shock of seeing that, uh, the awakening that it has in them, if, if left uh, unguided or uncoached, could consume them. You know, I, I remember, 15 years ago or so, one of my technicians when we were at the, in the hospital and she joined the mission and she came back completely distraught by the experience. Um, and thankfully, we, we chatted over a few times and she grew to understand and appreciate the experience that she had and get, kind of gave her a, a, a life mission uh, in different ways of helping those who are less fortunate. But for me, what I worry about is that there's no amount of debriefing or coaching or, or um, guidance that's going to uh, help me overcome what I would see with my own eyes. And um, that's what scares me. How do you plan to address that fear? Uh, I'm just gonna have to do it one day. So <laughs> I don't know if it's in a year or in 10 years. Um, uh, in, well, talk to, talk to me. I know you have family there. You still have family there, right? Uh, extended, very, extended family? Extended family um, that I don't know when was last time I spoke to any of them, to be honest with you. They're like cousins of my parents or uh, even second cousins of my parents. Most of us, most of my, my family have left because of Yubna being occupied in 48. Well, you know, uh, you have friends here on this screen and you have friends in the broader Fort Wayne area who would travel with you and who would uh, be support and who would offer you affection and love uh, while you were traveling there and undergoing the feelings that you were feeling, you know. So I just want to, I've said this to you privately, but I'm saying it to you publicly now too, man. You're putting me on the spot. I'll just call you and I'll say just, just. Say uh, but yeah, it's uh, I don't. I uh, I like to be aware of what I'm doing and where I am, and that awareness tells me that right now I don't think I can handle that. Sure, I I hear you. I'm yeah. I hear you, and I respect that. I appreciate that. But I appreciate all the people that tell me about the experience that they have with you, too. <laughs> Thank you for that. We'll, we'll do it sometime. Yeah. We'll do it sometime. Um, it's, obvious, it's obvious, though, that uh, when you talk about homesickness, you talked about uh, um, Qatar, you know, because you talked about uh, uh, wanting to be, when you think about this, you want to be back with your friends when you were a teenager. But you also carry Palestine as home in your heart. And... Um, in, one, in some ways, you have no place to call home. In another, in another way, you have many places that you call home. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, let, let me ask you about one of the things that I, uh, when I moved here 20 years ago, was uh, try to get to know uh, as many interfaith leaders, mm -hmm. leaders of the different faith communities as possible. And you know that we have a real rich... Uh, 
uh, set of uh, uh, different faith traditions here in Fort Wayne and Allen County. In fact, uh, 20 years ago, we were, and, and earlier, uh, Fort Wayne was called the city of churches, and more and more now, right, it's becoming the city of faiths. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're really appreciative of that kind of evolution. And I know that that's been something that's been close to your heart, your interfaith work. Uh, and I know it's been something that you, uh, uh, with the Iftar with Mayor Henry, uh, who's uh, uh, attended your, uh, who's held an Iftar, hosted one along with the Muslim community. Talk a little bit about your interfaith work and the importance of your relationship with various faith leaders and other, other leaders in the secular movement, leaders uh, of people with goodwill. So talk about about uh, that part of your personal mission. Um, I think in in many ways that that um, talking about Islam in particular crystallized after September 11, uh, where whether I like it or not, uh, whether it's intentional or not, uh, everything I say, everything I do is being viewed as a representation of the faith. Um, and uh, if you if you look at um, my uh, strengths finder profile, uh, and I've been taking that strengths finder for the past fifteen years or whatever, the number one um, uh, strength I guess that I have that never changes, you know, the top five always switch and whatever, is responsibility. <laughs> I wish I could shake it off, but it, it's never changed. It's always responsibility. So. I felt a sense of responsibility to be able to speak to the faith uh, and to speak about the faith in the sense of, I'm not here to tell you what Islam is not, I'm here to tell you what Islam is. And, you know, speak to the, um, the understanding of the faith as it's understood by its close to whatever, 1.8, 1.9 billion followers across uh, the, uh, the globe. And, and not be tainted by uh, the actions of a few. Uh, again, humanizing the label and, and whatnot. So that led me in, in many ways in learning more about the faith for me to learn it more, but also to be able to speak in a manner that others can relate to and understand. And as I was learning and growing into that, I understood more and more how closely related we are as differing faiths, especially if you talk about the Abrahamic faiths and Christianity and Judaism. Uh, and that similarity is something that we all need to be reminded of. Uh, and in particular for me as a Palestinian, uh, you know, the conflation of Judaism and Zionism or the conflation of Judaism and Israel and the Israeli government. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, showing that my issues are not with the faith of any particular individual, but my issues are with an occupying government that's apartheid, that's expansionist, that's colonialist, that, that you know, is killing people mercilessly and so on and so forth. So to tease that away from uh, faith, which unfortunately in a lot of people's minds, it's the two are interrelated. And to say, no, this is not a faith issue. This is a, a, um, a political uh, issue. So that, you know, got me more and more involved in, in reaching out in talking uh, with other faith leaders of the Jewish faith, of the Christian faith, and, and the various denominations within, within both. Um, and we all share, you know, this, this bond of we care for, uh, for our communities, we care for the humanity for our communities. And I think that's the layer where we connected outside of the faith with secular groups more on the, the equal rights or the, you know, people that even they may be religious, but they will tell you that I, I'm an American. American is a secular government. And so I don't want the conversations to revolve around religion. I want it to revolve around our ideals of, of government that we've established from early on. So once you, you, you find that common thread, uh, it pulls you in more and more. And for me, that common thread uh, I, I think came about uh, through uh, my recognition of um, uh, I'm being in the spotlight to speak about my faith, 
uh, and to speak about my faith with, with comfort and with understanding my own limitations. I'm not a scholar, I didn't study theology and, and so on and so forth, and just to speak to the common person. And that led me into a lot more of the interfaith work. We're winding down here, the, the hour has sped by. I just have a couple more questions for you. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was very moving, and I know it moved you too, and it moved you uh, not only in your heart, but it moved you to do some reflecting uh, about the state of affairs in America. And so let me just re relay this story back to you that you related on Facebook just about three weeks ago, as well as on your uh, blog. You were working at a pharmacy, and a young black teenage uh, man bought some athletic tape. You, you know where I'm heading with this, right? Mm -hmm. He paid for it, began to leave, then turned back again and asked for a receipt. And he said, just in case. Uh, fill in the blanks of the story and tell us about some of the lessons that you learned and that you shared uh, as you reflected upon this incident at the pharmacy. And, and, I, and I, I think I filled in a lot of the blanks, but the filling in the blanks came from our current state of affairs. Um, it would have been just a, a, uh, a regular, oh, just in case I want to return it. Uh, but unfortunately, in, in light of where we see ourselves today, uh, I took it completely differently. And again, I, don't, I can't speak to his intentions, but that's how I understood it. Um, and my understanding of the uh, uh, Black experience in America uh, has grown over the past few years as I got more and more into uh, fighting for justice for my people in Palestine and understanding the, that, that I can't just fight for one just cause. Uh, and that if I'm fighting for justice, um, that work, you know, without diluting one over the other, or one is more important than the other, um, carries its, uh, its own set of responsibilities. So I set out to learn more uh, from speaking with my friends from, uh, again, I'm not a black man in America, but I can relate on, on different levels uh, of how uh, the otherness uh, plays out in our interactions. And so, um, you know, from, from reading books to conversations to seeing how things uh, play out and seeing how we reduce the humanity of a person because of their skin color uh, just doesn't sit well with me. And so I wrote this, again, in the, under the umbrella of humanizing the label. Uh, to show that, um, I, I guess, sorry, I, I feel like I'm, I'm going into circles, but let me, let me put it in, in one clear incident in my mind that it just gave me the aha moment. And, and, you know, and I've been involved in this for many years, but it was about three or four years ago. And I was listening to NPR, and this gentleman is talking um, about he how he is a six foot three uh, African American law professor in an Ivy League school. Yeah, and he says that when he's walking downtown, he would whistle the tunes of Frozen so that people around him know that he has kids and he's not a threat. And that just blew my mind. I mean, just the fact that you have to put in an effort to think about how you're being perceived because that could, and, and it's not just because, oh, I don't want people to think that, you know, I'm this or that. It's, it could be, as we've seen, unfortunately, a, a life or death matter in certain situations. He could be laying on a curb with a, uh, a knee on his neck. It could, or it could be, you know, just the refused service or whatever in, and that just, blew my mind um and i and i knew that to a, an extent i do that um in a, a friend of mine uh, many years ago she commented she's like so when you're at home and you're really tired how is your accent and heather my wife commented it gets a little thicker and she's like so you're intentionally putting on 
<laughs> you know, the accent and the way that I speak. So I am perceived as intelligent, you know, or that um, I do certain things because of a response to a stereotype that I know is out there. Uh, and I catch myself doing it and I catch myself doing it for that reason. Uh, but I, it, it's nowhere near the level that a black man in particular in the United States. And that to me resonated on so many levels. And that to me um, uh, told me that if I'm ever to get justice in Palestine, uh, I need justice where I live uh, as well. Um, and, you know, to work on the environment that I'm in, um, because that carries uh, a, a much stronger message um, than anything else. You may or may not have seen this because you were speaking, but <clears throat> a number of the folks on the screen here were nodding their heads as you were speaking, Ahmed, uh, not only in agreement, but um, applauding uh, your insights uh, into the state of uh, uh, the state of things in our country today. And so thank you for that. Uh, one more question, and it's a personal one. Um, I know you well enough uh, that I know you're a socially and politically engaged person. Uh, under the present administration, uh, hey man, uh, you hit the trifecta. You know, you're, you're an immigrant, you're a Muslim, and you're a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. uh, so congratulations. Uh, have, have you become more politically radicalized? And what I'm asking is talk to us about, about Ahmed, the political activist. Uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about you uh, as political activist now. Um, I hate to tell you that it hasn't changed much um, because Trump, as big of an issue as he is, he is not the issue. In my mind, that struggle has always been there. Uh, those sentiments have always been there. Um, what Trump, in my mind, and with a lot of people in my conversations, has helped us see is uh, the fallacy of us calling ourselves a post-racial society. Uh, it uncovered the underlying um, sentiments of white supremacy. It uncovered the angst of, uh, you know, a majority that doesn't know how to uh, interact with a majority, a minority that's going to become a majority over the next few years. So that work from that sense has not changed. What's changed is that uh, I, I see a lot more people than I expected uh, not knowing how to respond to it. Uh, when you have a family member who's spouting hateful rhetoric and you're like, I don't think I agree with this, but I don't know how to act or how to respond to it. And to show them that they have a responsibility and how to kind of uh, help have these discussions or navigate them. Um, or, you know, the, the opposite of the, you know, the response to Trump is not the complete opposite end of the spectrum either. You know, that again, the dichotomy of, of, uh, of uh, liberal, conservative, and that. Now, there's a lot in the middle that where we can thrive uh, and then highlighting that a little more. That's, that's what this administration uh, has done for me as an American citizen uh, here, is that it, it crystallized, it clarified some of the objectives, but they still remain pretty much the same. When are you gonna run for office? <laughs> when you write me a check, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I um, talk about putting you on the spot, huh? I, I mean, it's it's something we've talked about, and potentially, maybe, uh, but uh, it's when the family's right, um, or it's the right time for for the family. Uh, we came close to it, but. Um, Family's not ready, and I'm not going to do anything to uh, to jeopardize that. So you, we hope that you'll share the news of our interviews with your friends. I'll remind you that Ahmed's 
uh, uh, podcast is The I in Immigrant, W-B-O-I. And also his blog is nomad, N-O-M-A-D 78 Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y dot com. Ahmed, uh, thanks for coming today. Do you have any parting words for us? Um, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think as, as far as parting words, I just want to say that um, what I've learned from a lot of my experiences is that we, to a, a larger extent, have lost the ability to have a conversation. Uh, we have lost the ability to ask questions without offense or to answer questions without defense. And that has guided a lot of my work and a lot of the, uh, the, the, the I and Immigrant podcast and everything is going back to simple conversations, uh, especially in, in the days of or the era of social media and the echo chambers that we live in and people uh, applauding the thought process that we have. If we don't engage others, uh, others who disagree with us, who disapprove of our viewpoints in respectful conversations and, uh, uh, and, and having a good, hearty, healthy discussion, uh, we will not uh, move beyond um, the, the fractions that we, that we have that, that have become more apparent in our community. So my parting words are keep talking, keep chatting, having conversations, um, and learning from each other. You know, Ahmed, uh, first of all, uh, once again, uh, thanks uh, for being with us today, Dr. Ahmed Abdul-Majid. Ahmed, you're, uh, you're an inspiration to many folks here in our community. You're uh, one of the uh, leaders. Uh, I was going to say young leaders. Uh, you're young to me, but uh, you're one of the established uh, leaders in a generation in our community, and we thank you for all the all the many ways that you inspire us and and challenge uh, our better angels. 